Linny planned for everything to happen. Or did he? This video contains a summary of the 4.0 Archon quests, both Act 1 and Act 2, a speculative analysis, as well as theories and questions that have emerged, including a wild theory I have about Farina following both acts. And you definitely don't want to miss that since this might reveal the hidden truth of the current Hydro Archon. I'm your leafy Loshiro Minzliff and I read the Genshin Impact lore so that you don't have to. Please keep in mind this is a leak-free zone, so any and all information included in this video is either confirmed by Hoyoverse or speculative in nature. No leaks, only drip. Act 1 starts with a momentary and bittersweet goodbye to Sumeru. Note that truth amongst the pages of Piranha is the title of a Sumeru Archon quest we might play through according to the Teyvat Travail trailer, so it's possible we might be coming back to Sumeru in the future. As Traveler and Paimon bid farewell to Dehya, there is a Fontanian who looks at them suspiciously. The pair make their way to Romaritime Harbor on the border of the Sumeru Desert and Fontaine. With sights set on finding their sibling, Traveler insists they meet the Hydro Archon as soon as possible. They eavesdrop on Reina and Etienne, who gives them insight into how the nation operates. Trials in Fontaine are conducted by the Chief Justice Nurulet. The verdict of said trials are determined by the Orchis Mécanique d'Analyse Cardinal, commonly known as the Oratress, an alleged invention of the Hydro Archon. These trials are seen more as entertainment for the citizens, regardless of the severity of the case. A man has died in a recent trial, but Reina and Etienne are more concerned with the theatrics of the trial. The people of Fontaine view their Archon as more of a celebrity or a mascot, and don't seem to revere her. The pair are unexpectedly greeted with a whimsical introduction from the Hydro Archon herself, Furina, who accuses them of breaking the law. Apparently, it is illegal to release a flying object on the first three days of the month. The famous Fontanian magician Linny vouches for them and asserts that Paimon is merely attached to Traveler by an invisible cord, which unbeknownst to the Archon was set up by Linny. From this encounter, we learn that Furina is rather insecure in her leadership abilities and dons a dramatic persona to entertain the masses. After Furina exits stage left, Linny and Lynette warn Traveler and Paimon of a prophecy spreading through Fontaine. In the end, the people will all be dissolved into the waters, and only the Hydro Archon will remain, weeping on her throne. Only then will the sins of the people of Fontaine be washed away. Every person in Fontaine is allegedly born with sin. And no matter how many trials a nation of justice holds, this sin cannot be absolved. The consequence of this sin has caused Fontaine's water levels to rise. As a result of this, a place Linny and Lynette used to play in during their childhood is now underwater. According to Linny, there are two explanations so far for the sin that Fontaineans have committed. The ancestors of Fontaine stole the powers of the sea and stirred its wrath, or the people of Fontaine failed to heed the first Hydra Archon's warnings and offended Celestia. To help the people of Fontaine flee from the prophecy, Linny had developed magic pockets, a magical bag which is small on the outside but extremely spacious on the inside. Delivering these magic pockets to NPCs as per Linny's request reveals some interesting dialogue. There are people who are fearful of the rising waters and people who liken it to going home. According to Ojuro, there is a story about how the people in Fontaine used to live in the ocean. As time wore on, the people desired to live on land and develop bodies that accommodated to land living. Being dissolved into water could be interpreted as Fontaineans returning to their roots to underwater living. This difference in interpretations of the prophecy is reminiscent of premillennial and postmillennial debates about the Christian rapture and the return of Christ. And fittingly so, there was an underwater achievement in Fontaine called Do You Believe in the Rapture? The group spots a girl pickpocketing people at the port, and they give chase. Linny is able to return the stolen items to their respective owners, but the thief managed to get away as she was way more skilled than Linny anticipated. Traveler and Paimon agree to follow Linny and Lynette home and collect materials for more magic pockets. And en route, they run into Charlotte, who informs them about a mysterious case that's been happening in Fontaine for 20 years. The Serial Disappearances of Young Women At Linny's home, they meet the twins' brother, Fréminette, who indicates that their father was returning soon. It starts to rain, 
and Linny notes that it rains in Fengtian when trials are being held at the opera Epicles. Clemenet recounts a story he heard from his mother that when the dragon of water weeps, the skies would cloud up and pour out rain. If he wanted to play outside, he would have to yell, Hydro dragon! Hydro dragon! Don't cry! Linny invites Traveler and Paimon to his first magic show at the Opera Epicles, and they agree to go with Linny, having already reserved seats for them. The pair take the magic pocket supplies to Estelle at the Beaumont workshop. Estelle uses a machine to craft items and weapons, and this machine is powered by Indemnidium, the main energy source of Fontaine, which is generated by the Oratrice via the collection of people's belief in justice during trials. Estelle is later accosted by a man named Trond and his lackeys, associates of an organization called the Conferie of Cabuguet. Estelle owes the Conferie money, and the exchange is interrupted by none other than Child, who claims that the Conferie actually owes the Northland Bank money as well. Note that the Northland Bank is a Schneeslein bank whose main operations are overseen by Pantalone, the 9th Fatui Harbinger. The establishment of new branches is overseen by Pulcinella, the 5th Fatui Harbinger. Trond and the Conferie instigate a fight which Child easily dominates, but momentarily loses control of his hydro powers. Recently, Child has been in a bad mood and feels a restless power stirring within him, and that it all may be tied to him losing control of his hydro vision. We learn that when he was 14, Child had fallen into the abyss but was taken care of by a woman named Skirk. She deemed him worthy of being her student because he had awakened it, and traces of it remained on him. Child speculates that it could be a massive whale he'd seen in a dream when he first fell into the abyss, a hydro construct you can see during his boss fight at Golden House. Note that Skirk is the one who taught him his foul legacy transformation. Child hasn't seen his master Skirk, and traces of where he first fell into the abyss are nowhere to be found. Child leaves by stating he's interested in sparring with champion duelists, Clorand, Farina's bodyguard being the one he'd been eyeing. He leaves Traveler with his Hydro Vision temporarily in fear of him losing control of his powers again. Traveler and Paimon head to the Opera Epicles, which eerily resembles a guillotine, at Erinias to witness a magic show Linny would be performing that night. At the Fountain of Lucine, right in front of the Opera House, Traveler hears a voice saying, Vashe. Vashe. Something they brush off as just their hypersensitivity to the Hydro element. Note that Vache is most likely a literary reference to Joseph Vache, a real-life French serial killer infamously known as the French Ripper. Lynette mentions that the Fountain of Lucine is where all the flowing water in Fontaine converges. Even the tears that fall to the ground will eventually gather at the fountain. The pair head inside to find their reserved seats and meet Nouvellet, the Chief Justice of Fontaine. The show begins, and the first act is a disappearing reappearing trick with Lynette which leaves the audience stunned. The second act involves a teleportation trick with the help of a random audience member, the one selected being the thief from earlier in the quest. There are two magic boxes, one placed on the stage and one placed in the audience aisle. Both Linny and the chosen audience member will teleport or swap places with each other at the end of the trick. Linny and the thief step into their respective boxes, and this trick ends with... And this is the moment that I knew this Archon quest would be the best we've played in the entire game so far. The water tank from Lynette's previous trick falls onto the teleportation box on stage, crushing and killing, not the thief, but surprisingly, Linny's assistant, Cowl. Verena presses charges on Linny for the murder of his own assistant and the kidnapping of an innocent audience member in direct relation to the serial disappearances of women plaguing the nation. Traveler counters by offering to be Linny's attorney on the case. Nouvellet declares a trial the following day. As they go collecting evidence in support of Linny, Traveler and Paimon encounter a woman named Navia, with her assistants Silver and Melus. Navia is the president of Spina di Rosula, a private investigation group that is funded by the donations of its supporters. Navia agrees to help with Linny's case as the whole thing seems suspicious to her. The trial commences. Farina states her case as follows. 
Looney entered the tunnel connecting the two boxes from the magic act. In the middle of the switch, Linny attacked the selected audience member, a Fontenian girl named Halsey, this altercation causing a loud thud which everyone in the audience above heard. His assistant, Cowell, arrived to witness him kidnapping Halsey. Linny knocked out Cowell and stuffed him into the stage box, and Linny organized the water tank to fall on top of the stage box in an elaborate scheme to kill Cowell and rule his death as an accident. On top of these allegations, Farina shares a startling discovery. Linny and Lynette are members of the House of the Hearth, an orphanage owned by Fatui Harbinger Arlequino. This means Linny and Lynette are likely agents for the Fatui, a notion that surprises Traveler and Paimon. Hurt and beyond annoyed from experiencing multiple cases of betrayals and trickeries in their journey, Traveler still proceeds to assist Linny in his case. After ample investigation and Linny admitting to the truth that he had been trying to investigate the core of the Oratrees, Traveler and Ace Detective Paimon proceed to vouch for Linny's innocence. Linny entered the tunnel connecting the two boxes from the Magic Act. He immediately used an air vent in the tunnel to access the Opera House basement, which is where the core of the Oratrees should be. Once at the basement, he heard a familiar voice in what should have been an empty room. Feeling that something was amiss, he returned to the tunnel immediately. Halsey's disappearance had already taken place unbeknownst to Linny, who rushed to the aisle box to complete the magic trick. Linny seems innocent, and Farina starts to worry about having wrongly accused someone. But the suspect for who may have kidnapped Halsey still remains a mystery. Traveler requests to have Cowell's belongings investigated, from which the guards find out that Cowell belonged to an organization that was selling illegal drugs, tubes of water from the primordial sea. In Cowell's notes, this water was said to have the ability to dissolve people from Fontaine. It's likely that the audience member Halsey was chosen to be a test subject. Things seem to be tipping in Linny's favor until a member of the guards named Vaughn claims that the same dissolving water was found in Linny's belongings. Navia interjects and surprisingly, she calls Halsey to the stand. Navia had caught Halsey snooping around the opera house and reasoned with her to testify so her sentence would be lessened. The actual series of events is as follows. Cowell had planned to dissolve a Fontanian woman named Halsey and frame Linny for her disappearance. After finding out which seat in the opera Epicles would belong to Halsey, Cowell had rigged the random number generator to always select her for the teleportation trick. As Linny's assistant, Cowell had access to the props and set up balloons in the aisle box to be filled with water from the primordial sea. As the box was lowered, the balloons would pop and the water would fall on and dissolve Halsey. The water tank was meant to fall on the stage box after the teleportation trick was completed to remove traces of the water from the primordial sea. However, Lillian had stolen Halsey's ticket, and being born from Mondstadt, the primordial seawater had no effect on her. When Lillian descended the tunnel as per the teleportation trick, Cowell had attempted to subdue her, thinking the primordial water needed time to take effect. Lillian proceeds to fight back and knock him out with a vase. The thud from the altercation is one that the audience above heard, but Linny, who at this time was in the air vent inspecting the oratory's core, did not. Lillian had stuffed Cowell in the stage box out of self-defense, completely unaware of its sabotaged nature. And Cowell became victim to what would have been his own crime. The Oratrice has decided that Linny is not guilty, but Nouvellet does suggest that Linny and Lynette still need to be investigated for their conduct in regards to their unsolicited inspection of the Oratrice and their ties to the Fatui. Nouvellet also questions Vaughn, the guard who claimed that Linny had water from the primordial sea in his possession. Vaughn confesses that he was just following orders from his boss. The organization Vaughn worked for was supposed to blame the serial disappearances on Linny and draw suspicion on the Fatui. This organization is responsible for the distribution of water from the primordial sea, which can dissolve Fontanians but in extremely low doses can cause unforgettable exhilaration and is being sold as an illegal drug. The boss of this organization was also behind all the serial disappearances, and right before he reveals the identity of his employer, Vaughn immediately dissolves into water. With the case over, Linny and Lynette thank the Traveler for their help. 
However, Traveler seems very bitter during the exchange. Linny tries to reason with Traveler by sharing his perspective. Linny and Lynette were orphans who struggled to provide for themselves as street performers. After being adopted by a noble, Linny later learned that this noble was more interested in his talent for magic tricks, using the twins as performers for banquets for his social circle. One day, after a banquet show, Lynette had failed to show up in the same return vehicle as Linny. In one of the darkest twists in the game so far, Linny learns that the noble had sold Lynette off to another man as a gift. Linny had rushed to rescue his sister, but when he arrived, all he saw was the other man dead on the floor, with Arlequino over his body. Arlequino had taken in Linny and Lynette under her wing in her orphanage, the House of the Hearth. Members of the House of the Hearth eventually grow up to be members of the Fatui, and they continue to see each other as family and maintain close bonds. Arlequino and the House of the Hearth all have the same goal, use the Hydronosis to save Feng Ten from the prophecy. As all of them, including Arlequino, are from Feng Ten, Linny felt extremely compelled to support her in her cause. Traveler, still visibly annoyed, offers a simple goodbye to Linny with no further explanations. Navia later invites Traveler and Paimon to share a meal with her at Hotel de Bord for their victory in Linny's trial. And this is where Act 1 of the Feng Ten Archon Quest ends. There are a couple things to note in Act 1. Firstly, remember the Feng Tenian man from Sumeru who side-eyes Traveler and Paimon? We still don't know who he is yet. Secondly, the concept of sin in Feng Ten. Acts of sin up until this point have for the most part been in reference to Conri and their deeds. According to the Mocking Mask and the Pale Flame artifact set, Fatui Harbinger Piero was a sage from Conria who failed to stop the doomed nation from tearing away the veil of sin, ushering in a tide of divine wrath. This tearing away of the veil of sin could be a reference to the biblical veil of sin. This veil was a symbol of what separated man from God. If the Conrians were somehow guilty of blurring the lines between man and gods, possibly in a means to usurp the divine, then are Fontenians guilty for having done something similar? Thirdly, what was it that Child woke up when he fell into the abyss? If it is a whale from the abyss that Child saw in his dream, could this being be responsible for Fontenians dissolving into water? Could it be responsible for the sin Fontaine committed or the true agent for what will bring them judgment or dissolve them in the future? Fourthly, in regards to Child using control of his hydrovision, abyssal powers, his foul legacy transformation, and celestial powers, his hydrovision, probably repel each other. The power he claims is growing inside of him might be abyssal in nature, causing his hydrovision to possibly weaken. To summarize Act 1, we learned that Feng Den is somewhat of a dystopian nation where their Archon is extremely insecure in her leadership skills. There is an unsolved case that involves the serial disappearances of Feng Denian women across 20 years. Feng Denians harbor a sin that will soon be punished by a looming prophecy. Fatui Harbinger Arlequino has goals to retrieve the Hydronosis to save the nation from said prophecy. There's a Hydro Dragon who when it cries causes it to rain. Child is losing control of his hydrovision, and it might involve him having woken up it from his past. Now on to Act 2 of the 4.0 Archon Quests. This is a good place to pause this video and complete Act 2 on your own, but if not, the story picks up right where Act 1 ends with Navia inviting Traveler and Paimon to Hotel de Bord for a celebration meal. At Hotel de Bord, the three discuss Linny's trial and the serial disappearances. Navia expresses a lack of trust in the guard, seeing as one was coerced into working for an illegal drug trade, and she also suggests that this would be the best time to approach the Hydro Archon. Her loss in Linny's trial would have caused her to retreat in embarrassment, so there's less likely to be a line of Fontanians waiting for her company. Paimon accidentally drinks Navia's Fanta, a popular Fontanian beverage, to which Traveler and Paimon comment that it tasted salty and gross. Navia makes note of this since Fanta is normally sweet. After the dinner, Traveler and Paimon head back to the Fountain of Lucene, only this time both of them hear a voice coming from the fountain. Traveler blacks out and wakes up face to face with an oceanid asking them about a man named Vache. When this oceanid was human, her name was Vignere, and she had dissolved in the arms of her lover Vache. Vignere laments that she could not comfort him and urges Traveler that if they are ever to run into Vache, to tell him to move on and not look for her. Traveler finally wakes up to Navia, Silver, and Melus defending them from a horde of Gardamex. Lerun surprisingly comes to the rescue with the intent of honoring her final promise to Navia's father to protect his daughter. 
She tips off the group, stating that the Gardamex sent to attack Traveler were illegal as they had no serial numbers on them. Plurand and Navia have a strained relationship due to circumstances that'll be revealed in a moment. But after Clorand's departure, the group reconvenes in the sewers of the Court of Fontaine, or Fleuve Sandra, for safety. It's here we learn a little more about Navia and the Spina di Rosula. Three years ago, her father Callus was accused of murdering his friend, but rather than standing trial, he chose to duel to maintain his honor. His champion duelist opponent was none other than Clorand, who was ultimately the one to kill him. Laurent has stated that Callus's final wish was for her to keep his daughter Navia safe, a wish that Clorand still honors to this day. Navia has yet to find forgiveness for Clorand in her heart, hence their strained relationship. Callus had also allegedly intended to die in his final duel. The private investigation group Spina di Rosula gets its funding from its public supporters, but due to its late president Callus now being labeled as a murderer, the group now struggles financially. Navia had been trying to research this vache that Traveler and Paimon speak of, but to no avail. The trio had to Nurulit to inquire about Vache as the Chief Justice would have any and all archives relevant to the serial disappearances case. Unfortunately, Nurulit is unable to produce any records on a man named Vache. Before the group leaves, Nurulit apologizes to Navia for Callus' death, an apology that makes Navia visibly upset as she states Nuvillet did nothing about it despite knowing full well something about her father's case was amiss. The known sequence of events of the night Callus' friend Jacques was killed is as follows. Callus and Jacques had planned to meet up at a banquet to discuss and exchange information. Witnesses recall hearing two gunshots from the courtyard. Jacques was dead on the floor with Callus holding the gun. The trio head outside and it begins to rain despite there not being a trial at the opera at the place. Regarding the accusations that Callus may have killed his own friend, Traveler suggests the possibility of a third person involved due to there being a pile of clothes allegedly left at her father's crime scene. This third person may have killed Callus's friend, dissolved himself with water from the primordial sea, and successfully framed the murder on Callus. They head to Poisson. Spina di Rosula's headquarters to get more intel on the serial disappearances case as it might be related to Callus' death. Melus, Navia's guardian, reveals several things that might aid them in their search for evidence. There was a popular drink called Synth that was being distributed. Navia suspects that Synth is laced with minute traces of water from the primordial sea. The long-term effects of drinking Synth include extreme paranoia and anxiety which started destroying people's lives. Callus was against the use of synth and called for a complete ban of it, which incurred the wrath of the sellers. He was determined to track down the mastermind behind the synth operation and put a stop to its distribution once and for all. Callus had befriended some synth vendors with hopes of one of them being his informants, one of them being a man named Jacques, who had incredible remorse towards his involvement in the synth business. Melus informs the group about three suspects he'd been investigating as possible synth informants infiltrating the Spina di Rosula. Through collecting evidence, Traveler, Paimon, and Navia realized several things. Jacques was ordered to kill Callus by the synth higher-ups but struggled to fulfill the order as Callus was his friend. The guard and mechs sent to attack Traveler and Paimon are considered private units and are extremely expensive and the use of them are usually kept in secret. With the amount of power and wealth the synth leader must have, the group narrowed down Malus's suspects to a man named Marcel, the founder of the Conferie of Cabuyer, an extremely successful and wealthy market guild. Remember that men from the Conferie had threatened to harm Estelle if she failed to pay back the money she owed in Act 1. The group is later informed that Child is being put on trial for the serial disappearances. Traveler and Paimon use the distraction of this trial as an opportunity to collect more evidence for Navia and infiltrate the synth headquarters, the location of which was given by Melus as Navia's father had found it before his death. In the meantime, Navia leaves for the opera Epiclase to clear Child's name. In the synth headquarters, Traveler and Paimon find the source of the water from the primordial sea and belongings of the missing women. Notes reveal that Vache was the lead researcher and had dissolved at least 20 women for his experiments. They also find the diary of Vignere, the woman who had dissolved and turned into an oceanid, and her diary containing a list of baby names, her favorite name being Marcel. At the opera Epiclase, Navia calls Marcel as a true culprit behind the serial disappearances and the leader of the synth business. 
Traveler and Paimon arrive at the scene to present all their evidence from the synth headquarters to Nuvilet. Marcel confesses that he is Vache, an adventurer from Snezhnaya who had lost the love of his life, Vignere, when she touched the water from the primordial sea and dissolved. He blames the justice system for failing him when he reported her dissolving to the guards, and they turned a blind eye to it. Across 20 years, he'd been kidnapping and dissolving Fontenian women in hopes that one of them could be revived, a solution he could use to bring Vignere back to life. His guild, the Conferie of Cabillère, was considered the sister organization to the Spina di Rosula led by Callus, but due to the latter's determination to shut down his synth business, Marcel had ordered Jacques to kill Callus. Due to Jacques' wavering allegiance to the synth operations, Marcel had entrusted an assassin to kill both Jacques and Callus. The assassin had succeeded in killing Jacques. Callus had wrestled the gun from the assassin and shot the assassin out of self-defense. Marcel then dissolved the assassin's body in hope that the rain on that night would remove possible traces of a third party being involved. Hence, the assassin's pile of clothes being left behind. Callus had asked for a duel to defend his honor knowing full well he would die to Clorand. His death would guarantee Navia's safety as Marcel had originally targeted Navia to be one of his dissolving test subjects. With Callus gone, Marcel had no motive to use Navia as leverage until recently when she restarted the investigation on the serial disappearances case. Marcel was the one to replace Navia's Fanta from earlier with water from the Primordial Sea, which Paimon drank instead. He was also the one to send the private Gardamex to attack Traveler and Paimon in retaliation for foiling his plans to dissolve Navia. Marcel, now added to be Vache, is given a guilty verdict by the Oratrix and is taken away. As for Child, regarding his involvement in the serial disappearances case, the Oratrix finds him guilty to the shock of everyone playing this Archon quest. Child retaliates and is swiftly apprehended by Nuvilet and is taken away until further investigation is conducted. Ferdina is left flustered after losing a case yet again with her having been the one to accuse Child of the serial disappearances. There is growing suspicion and distrust for the Hydro Archon amongst the crowds due to the Oratrice probably returning a wrong verdict despite allegedly being Ferdina's own invention. Traveler and Paimon prepare to leave the opera Epiclase but are stopped by an apprehended Marcel who asks how they knew about his old identity Vache when he was careful to cover any traces of it. Traveler tells Marcel about the voice they'd heard at the Fountain of Lucine, and Marcel begs to go to the fountain to which Nouvellet obliges. Marcel, having ingested large amounts of synth due to his depression for the past 20 years, has developed hypersensitivity to the hydro element and comes face to face with the ocean at Vignere in a dream realm. Or so he thinks. Lock folk or oceanids are beings born of water's essence. According to the Dew of Repudiation, water contains memories and willpower, and that these things can grow when bodies of water meld together. This could be how Lock folk are born or achieve sentience. With that being said, when Marcel had dissolved all these women, their residual memories and life forces have come together to form a hive mind as an oceanid. This hive mind also includes the consciousness of Vignere, who was ashamed of what Marcel had done to these women. Marcel's victims enact revenge, and Marcel is killed with his official cause of death being fright. A few days later, Traveler and Paimon catch up with Navia, and the trio visit Callus's grave together. They are surprised to find Nuvilet already there paying his respects. It had been raining for the past couple days since Charles and Marcel's trials. Nuvilet had come to Callus's grave to apologize as Callus had sacrificed his life to save his daughter in what Nuvilet recognizes as a justice higher than life itself. The regret of not defending Callus when he could have had been plaguing the chief justice for several days. And after Navia sincerely forgives Nuvilet, the rain immediately stops. Hydro Dragon, Hydro Dragon, don't cry. Thus ends Act 2 of the 4.0 Archon Quests. There are a couple questions and theories I have following Act 2. Remember the Fontanian man from Sumeru who side-eyes Traveler and Paimon? Well, we still, still don't know who he is yet. Is Nuvilet the Hydro Dragon? In Nuvilet's drip marketing post, his vision and constellation are hidden, which reveals a lot more about his identity than you might think. 
Nuvilet's introduction reveals a character who could be from that land. Shabalanke warns of a time coming where someday when they return, their true ordeal shall begin. This could be a reference to the seven dragon sovereigns who lost the war in lands of Tevat to the primordial god in humans. Apep is a dendro dragon, but could Nuvilet be the hydro dragon, the ruler of the Vishaps? There's an even more suspicious hint on Genshin's official Reddit post. Nuvilet's introduction includes the heading he who looks down on all that are haughty, a reference to a bible verse about the leviathan, a sea creature usually depicted as a sea serpent or sea dragon. Note that in scenes that Nuvilet felt turmoil in his heart, it would rain. The rain would stop when he finds peace. Will child die in the Fontaine are conquests? There are concerns about whether or not Child will meet an unfortunate end due to him leaving his vision with us as items left with us from a character in Archon Quest usually turn up... dead. I don't necessarily think this is always the case as we've received Dvalin's clear tear at the end of the Mondstadt Archon Quest and Dvalin is very much alive. Why was Child declared guilty by the Oratrice for the serial disappearances case? I'm assuming this has something to do with whatever it was that Child woke up when he fell into the abyss. This makes me wonder if the whale Child had seen in the abyss is a catalyst for the current prophecy in which everyone in Fontaine will be dissolved. Unintentionally, Child could have had a hand in this prophecy coming to fruition, hence the Oratrice declaring Child guilty. But how does the Oratrice know what happened to Child when he was in the abyss? Was the Oratrice or something related to it present when this had happened? Or is the Oratrice controlled by Celestia, and is Celestia somehow aware of what had happened to Child in the Abyss? We've identified that the Oratrice is conscious, according to Linny, and is able to come to conclusions with the evidence that it's given during trials. I have a wild theory about this, so buckle up and clench. Here's the theory. Furina might have a twin. This twin could have been sacrificed to create the Oratrice, and now this twin's consciousness could be what's powering it, making decisions on the trial's final verdicts. Nahira states that Furina also has the right to make the final decision when it comes to verdicts, meaning Furina and the Oratrice might be equal in authority. Furina imagining two of herself in her internal monologues might be her filling in for her now missing twin. In Act 1 of the Fontaine Archon Quest, Linny explores an air vent to find the Oratrice's core. Close to where the Oratrice core should be, Linny hears a mysterious voice. Fun fact, at the end of Act 2 of the Fontaine Archon Quest, you can hear Furina crying at the Fountain of Lucene. So interminable! So lonely! <laughs> Just how much longer? <laughs> she seems to be lamenting the fact that she is now alone even before the looming prophecy is fulfilled. But is it Furina's voice that we're hearing? Or her twins from the Oratrice? Not to mention, Oratrice is the female form of the word orator, which is a skilled and elegant public speaker. But what if Furina wasn't part of a set of twins, but rather, triplets? In Roman mythology, Furina was the goddess of water springs. Furie, the term closest to the goddess Furina, is a Roman equivalent for Arenes in Greek, the name being possibly an inspiration for Arenes in Fontaine, the place where court trials take place. Arenes in Greek is a term for the three goddesses of divine punishment. Three goddesses. Not to mention in Fontaine's Arenes, at the outdoor theater where you watch Coppelius and Coppelia dance, there are three thrones. This could mean that the former Hydra Archon Lord Amrita, the Oratrice, and Furina could be triplet goddesses or three siblings with Linny, Linnet, and Fleminet being their literary counterparts. Not to mention there are three authorities in Justice in Fontaine, Nuvilet, the Oratrice, and Furina. And most importantly, three Moon Sisters. Then again, we don't exactly know what voice Linny heard at the core of the Oratrice. For all we know, it could be the voice of his parents, but with the themes of parallel forces contradicting one another and twins, it definitely has me pondering this particular theory. The water of the primordial sea is flowing upwards in the synth headquarters. This could have something to do with the theories that Teyvat was flipped upside down. According to Nuvilet, the primordial seawater was a conduit for new life, but perhaps due to Teyvat being upside down, the primordial seawater now operates in an opposite manner destroying life instead of creating it. 
To summarize Act 2, we learned that the serial disappearances case was solved and the culprit was a sadistic man named Marcel, Bache, who had conducted the dissolving experiments to try to resurrect his lover. Navia's father was an innocent man and sacrificed his life to keep his daughter safe. Child is still considered guilty in regards to his involvement with people in Fontaine dissolving. After losing yet another trial, Hydra Arconturina is in an even more flustered state. 4.0's Archon quests are two of the best ones we've had so far. With the amazing use of theatrics, music, and one of the most engaging Archon Quest mechanics, I'm all the more excited for what the rest of this region has in store. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like and subscribe, and I'll see you on the next video. I'm your Leafy Loshir Minzef, and I read the Genshin Impact lore so you don't have to.